Good afternoon or, or good morning, wh wherever you are. This is our, um, our fireside chat. Um, I'm not sure how cozy everyone is feeling, um, but I have my mug of tea in, in front of myself, and it's a relatively cool afternoon here in Maputo. So I think we can, uh, it's not cold enough to light a fire, but we can suspend our disbelief for a few moments. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Sam Jones. I'm a research fellow with UNU Wider, as I said, based in, in Mozambique, primarily working with the Ministry of Economy and Finance. But uh, today it's a real privilege uh, and honor to be able to have a, a brief conversation with Professor Miguel Urquiola. Um, I probably got the pronunciation wrong, so That's forgive me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, I think, Miguel, if I may, I, I mean, I'm sure that to most of us here you need no introduction, but just very briefly, Miguel is a professor and chair of the Department of Economics at Columbia, uh, that's the one in New York, and is also a member of the UNU wider board. Miguel's research has focused primarily on, I mean, very broadly speaking on education, but particularly around issues of school choice and the ongoing debate around the merits of public versus private provision of education. Um, if I recall, I think I first came into contact with his work um, in uh, the 2006 Apples and Oranges paper, which I'm not sure if you remember, but uh, I thought it was very helpful because it gave a, some kind of innovative uh, and interesting measures of education system performance and how to do that using survey data. Um, some of the more recent work has looked at school vouchers. There's a, a very important survey in the Journal of Economic Literature on school vouchers. And also um, a recent discussion about whether education is a consumption or investment good in the annual review of economics. But more recently, um, Miguel has turned his attention to higher education. And he has a recent book out entitled Markets, Minds and Money. And he asks and answers, of course, why is it that the vast majority of top ranked research universities are located in the USA? I mean, I guess for many of us, we just take that for granted, but um, as he shows in, in the book, and it might want to elaborate on, this wasn't always the case. Uh, in Europe, uh, I mean, Europe, European universities, UK, Germany in particular, were some of the leading centers of education for a long time until at least the end of the 19th century. Um, and I'm sure that for many of us um, attending the conference here, uh, we have some academic interest or role with universities. So, so how universities can be strengthened, and particularly the research element of universities, how that can be uh, strengthened and nurtured is, is very relevant. So uh, we're gonna start our chat um, with a little bit focusing on the book, but I should say beforehand that if anyone wants to drop in uh, and ask a question, um, you're more than welcome. So please just place that in the Q&A, make sure you click session and then Q&A, and feel free to write your question there. So uh, turning back to the book, Miguel, you, um, I think you grew up in Bolivia, but took your university education uh, in the US. So was this choice of topic, uh, does, does that, did that come from your personal experience uh, in any way? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, like any, topic it comes from you know somewhat from personal experience but also um like a trajectory i think as you said i uh, grew up in bolivia and i worked there after i finished college uh, mm -hmm. and um one piece of advice i i i got there uh that i followed or i i had to follow because it was a boss's instruction basically was to to travel to chile and see a little bit about education reform in chile which is a a, a forefront country and so looking at Chile, I became very interested in, in educational markets because as you know, Chile is one of the uh, forerunners in sort of putting in place uh, vouchers and sort of having a for-profit whole uh, large educational sector. Um, that was news to me, I, I did not know that. And then I, I would say I spent the, the next many years of my life uh, working on that type of thing. And kind of, you know, I think that most of my work on, on Chile at least and on, on uh, vouchers, some of it said, uh, says that that markets are not a free are are not a silver bullet of sorts in education. Things may not work very well. I, I think I had made that point 
um, you know, which is a controversial point, but I think that the uh, a lot of the experience shows that surprisingly, perhaps, certainly surprisingly to me when I first approached it, they don't seem to work that well in some cases. And so I had been doing that for a long time. And then for the book, I thought, well, why don't I think of a case where I think that markets worked well in education? And can we look at the factors that make them work badly in one case? And why do they work well? Uh, and so then I was looking around. And of course, one way, you know, I've lived in American universities for a long time. Uh, they're very market oriented. The U.S. educational system, as so much of the U.S., is very market oriented. And then, and then you see that, lo and behold, it has a university sector that, in terms of research at the top, performs extremely well. And as you mentioned, was not always the case. The U.S. was not a leader. And so I got into it that way, sort of saying, can I see a place where you know the opposite of what I've usually said is true, and can I explain why? And are the same deep factors behind both observations? And kind of that's how I got to the book topic. That's, yeah, that, that's interesting because I was actually going to ask exactly because a lot of your research has been the opposite, showing some of the, the risks associated with this private provision. So perhaps, I mean, could you very briefly, just, just for us who, who, who may not have, have read the book, yeah. you know, what, what, what stood out for you as some of those factors then that, yeah. that, that explain why private provision in this case worked well? Works well and not in others. So I would, let me just mention two factors. Uh, uh, and each of these will say sort of there are things that get messed up in education usually when there's lots of markets and that for the case of research might not. One is a factor I call sorting, which is um, I think it is an innate you know, trait of many educational systems to sort of sort people out, that customers and all kinds of actors want to sort people out. Uh, by sorting, I mean basically uh, a tendency of like to congregate with like. So, you know, it could be wealthy people want to go to school with wealthy people, people of this ethnic group want to go to school with this ethnic group, people of this religious group want to go uh, to school with that, with the same, with the same religious group. This is, um, you know, I think, a, I'm not going to say universal, but it is a predominant tendency in many countries and many educational systems. My sense is that in K through 12, this often messes things up because it becomes very hard for the customer to kind of tell apart quality from, from, you know, sort of say, tell apart what we call usually as economists value added uh, versus just absolute achievement. It is very hard if, if you're a, a, a parent, I'm, I'm going to say in Maputo or Lima or London, and you're looking for a school, it's very hard, I'll speak for myself to sort of say, which school is actually good at teaching and which school is just full of kids who I, I you know, who are high achieved. Um, by contrast, I think that uh, sorting, I argue, uh, at, at the university level creates a series of dynamics that might not be bad for the production of research. For example, it tends to concentrate resources, stuff like that, things that you need for research. It tends to concentrate talent and stuff like that. So sorting, I would say, is factor one, and it kind of messes things up in some cases, and it makes them work in others, and it's not obvious when that's going to happen. The other thing, let me just, to not speak too long, mention a second one, which is observability, and relates to this issue, like what can I observe in people's performance? As we know, because there's a lot of uh, people working on things like teacher value added, it's very hard to observe performance of, of teachers, for example. This is why we work on it, right? If it were easy to know which teacher is good or bad, we would know right away. Uh, and in fact, even for researchers, it's hard to predict which teacher might be good or bad. It's hard to know just by, by looking at videos of teachers. By contrast, I think for researchers, there's a lot more observability. It's certainly not perfect. There's noisy stuff, but we can sort of see we, you know, which chemistry professor is writing papers? Are these papers having a big impact or not? Observability is a key thing. If you don't have observability, this is not just about education. If you don't have observability, almost nothing will work well. Uh, and That's you interesting. Could, could I just, um, just interrupt? I mean, I'm just interested. I mean, you know, some of us would say, wow, this kind of the, re the this, I mean, revolution in terms of observability yeah. hasn't been for, for many of us, it, it, you know, you could you could say, well, this is the last thirty years, maybe that yeah. the many universities have moved to research excellence frameworks and so on. Was this yeah. true earlier on uh, that perhaps we, you know, some of us might be might not be aware of? And was this already starting in the early twentieth century? Right. So that's that's a good question. So you mean sort of observability of research output research? Yeah. It, yeah. So, I mean, impact fact. I'm thinking impact factors yeah. and uh, so you I know. Think Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I think there's one way, there's one place where you can draw a big distinction between Europe and the US. In Europe, it was already the case by the end of the 19th century for sure that there was some observability for research in the sense that, for example, there were 
journals where people were publishing these sort of reports from scientific societies. The US lagged behind badly in this. Uh, and okay. one of the things that it did around the turn of the century, 1890s, uh, is you have things like the American Economic Association, the American Chemical Society being created and creating journals and sort of observability to see whether people are doing research. Mm -hmm. That is one area. Um, there is a there was a famous mathematician who got a job at Johns Hopkins, was recruited, this English guy. Uh, mm -hmm. And he told this anecdote that he said that the president of Johns Hopkins, and it, this was like 1880, who really believed in research, kept bugging him to create a journal for mathematics in the US. And he said, I kept telling him, there's nothing to publish. So why would he do this, you know? Uh, and so that anecdote illustrates that this is an infrastructure for observability that has to be created. It, it has to be nurtured. Uh, the US was late to the game relative to Europe, but it's one thing that helped it sort of catch up. For developing countries, I think, you know, it's costly to, to set up uh, uh, net, you know, a system to measure research output. And for developing countries, my guess is that actually, thanks to the internet and things like that, it's much easier these days to sort of piggyback on a, on a, on a measurement thing that already exists, right? So like uh, journals these days are more globalized. Uh, and mm. so you don't have to create, like the US had to create its own journals in a way because things work differently. It's not obvious to me that say, you know, uh, say, say uh, you know, emerging countries have to do it now. Yeah, and that, I mean, talking about developing countries, I mean, I think it's it's a particularly interesting issue. I mean, perhaps more than anything, academia is a global market these days, right? Yeah. I mean, you you yourself came from Bolivia. Yeah. Um, you know, there's ma many of the the top researchers in the world gravitate towards the U.S. Yeah. Now, in a way, you know, that's sorting, right? <laughs> Which yeah, is exactly sorting. what you talk about. Yeah. But what does that mean for students in developing countries, particularly at the undergraduate level, where, you know, the ability to move is, is difficult, particularly it's highly costly. I mean, could, could there be a, I mean, is this a classic brain drain problem that, you know, the top researchers now go to, you know, foreign universities, leaving a lower quality of instruction back home? Yeah, I think that it is a problem. Uh, and it is true that, like you say, um, academics at least has become much more global. And at the top level of academics, this is one, you know, there's a lot of also sorting has this feature that it's very self-reinforcing, right? So that, that, that the fact that the US has such great universities makes it easier to recruit away people. Um, in terms of an undergraduate though, I think that here is where the observability comes back. I think that the US universities by and large, based on noisy measures, imperfect measures, are able to recruit some of the best researchers in the world. This is clear. Yeah. If you're a German top academic, you'll get offers from the US. It's not obvious to me that this means that they're recruiting the best teachers. And when you're an mm -hmm. undergraduate, what you want are good teachers. Uh, and researchers, you know, top researchers can be excellent teachers. They are by definition excellent teachers for teaching, for example, PhD students and people at the cutting edge because they kind of know the cutting edge, so they know how to talk about the cutting edge at least. But it's not clear that they're that they're necessarily better at teaching microeconomics one, right? And so, right. Uh, in terms of of the the more basic type education, uh, in a way, one might be better off, I think, in places where that are less less focused on this uh, rat race for getting the best researchers. And teachers at many you know universities across the world, which are not elite research universities may just be more focused on, you know, providing or there's space for them to be more focused on providing a good chemistry, you know, organic chemistry class rather than trying to write something that is cutting edge. So I don't worry as much for the teaching side. I don't think it's obvious that, say, Stanford has absolutely the best teachers. It could be, but uh, it's not obvious to me. So Sam, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I was just uh, muted there. Yeah. I, 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 that kind of it's very interesting you say that because there's a trend, certainly, you know, in a lot of um, most countries, including developing countries, to say that you know all all university teachers, all univer you know university faculty should be focusing on research. Um, so I mean, it may be what you're saying is that should we be going back? I'm just provoking a little bit, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should we be going back to a model? which was uh, existed in some countries, uh, you know, a, a number of years ago, where yeah. you have a distinction between research universities and teaching universities. I mean, is that maybe a comparative advantage of some institutions could be on the teaching, 
whilst other um, universities could be on the on 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 the research. Is this yeah. I mean, is this is this a model you you think would would work, or am I getting into dangerous territory here? You are you are <laughs> you are very provocative. Uh, I, I am sympathetic to to the idea that not every institution should do everything, right? So, so for example, um, I think I've uh, heard a famous education economist, Caroline Hawksby, say this. You know, Caroline uh, Caroline Hawksby has said Stanford or Harvard do not have a comparative advantage at training a large number of people in sort of basic things. That's just not what their comparative advantage is in. Uh, and I think she's used the the words. It would be misplaced energy kind of to try to make them do that. Uh, and so you have, for example, Raj Chetty has shown in his research, amazing schools at training a lot of people. One close to where I live in New York is, is the City University, CUNY. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, now this doesn't mean, and here, you know, uh, on average, I think universities everywhere should aim for their faculty to have PhDs, for example, but it doesn't mean that everyone should try to do everything. And I'm sympathetic to that idea. Uh, and therefore, I'm not hostile to the idea you mentioned that one could have some faculty focus more on teaching and some focus more on research. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that is happening uh, in some countries. Uh, I mean, some academic job postings now tend to say, well, some of them I've seen say teaching specialization, research yeah. specialization. It doesn't mean that you, you're exclusive, but it's a focus. Um, yeah. I, think, I think then the question uh, would be, is teaching at the, uh, at the university level as observable as research? Yeah, I don't think it is as, as, as observable. I think that once one looks at teaching at, at the university level, one starts to get back into the world we live in when we look at teaching in the K-12 level, that it, it, it gets harder. You know, we can see student evaluations, uh, and so we know which teachers make students happy in some sense. But for example, the real outcomes we care about when we uh, teach at a university is, is this person going to be productive in the long term, right? Is this person going to have a good job? Is this person going to be an interesting person? Is there, will they contribute to society? We don't see those outcomes until much later on. Uh, as much as, for example, in the previous education session, we were saying, uh, or the moderator was saying, you know, it's tough to measure, uh, you know, learning uh, in many developing countries and measure performance. There we're looking at outcomes where we say, we'd like to see where you're at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, and ideally we can measure that well. At the university level, it's even harder, I think. And so observability yeah. there, again, you're in a, this quicksand where things are very hard. There may be teachers who are really good at the university level and are unpopular, right? And they're, uh, and so, um, and I think even students realize that with with the long term. They, they say, you know, Professor, Professor Jones yelled at me, but ex post, years later, <laughs> Years later, well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a story, I think so, some people in, they did some research and actually took in a trained actor to do a lesson. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the brief was to be as, you know, as kind of a fun and engaging as possible. Don't teach them anything. And of yeah. course, the course evaluations were the best that they'd ever heard of, right. precisely because it was picking up, uh, not that the fact they'd learned anything, just the fact that they enjoyed being there. It was entertaining. Yeah. Um, so, so yes. Yeah. This is one thing I mentioned in the book that as chair of a department, if the dean or the provost came to me and said, Miguel, hire excellent researchers, I would say, easy, just give me money, right? If they came and told me, hire excellent teachers, it's not as easy. Observability, yeah. How do I know? Yeah. Observability yeah. there becomes, becomes problematic. Yeah. Exactly. No, I, I'm saying the time is is yeah, is, time is, is up, quite yeah. short. So could I just ask you, maybe I don't see any questions in the chat or anything, so maybe one last question. Sure. I mean, from develop, from the perspective of development economics, um, yeah. you know, there is actually the criticism that maybe the concentration of all the great researchers, even if they're from developing countries originally, the fact that they're not in these, you know, the, the countries where they're doing research, yeah. and also uh, the fact that, you know, that, that there's a concentration of influence in, in, you know, a handful of universities. Yeah. That could be bad for the discipline. Do you have any, any thoughts on this debate at the moment? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, it is risky, I think, pri primarily for the reason you mentioned, which there's less exposure. Uh, and I think that is the risk in this. And, you know, that's a risk that's a bit specific to development economics or certain, you know, to lots of fields, not to all of them. Like we would worry less about that for someone who's doing, I don't know, some type of classical music or something. That, 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 that is a concern. 
perhaps it's somewhat mitigated in recent years by the greater ease of travel and you know things like we are on right now these screens but maybe you know maybe travel is getting harder and so i think that is a concern uh, i have to be consistent with what i say in the book i worry less about the concentration than most people i think but i agree i agree that there is a danger that things become kind of like insular and then you're not looking at the world in the way that you need to yeah, I guess it's about what conversation are you part of. If you're part of a conversation amongst other elite academics only, yeah. uh, then that can be somewhat detached from, I guess, some of the, the challenges and problems that may be, uh, the, 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 to which you would be exposed if individuals were located in, in a developing country. In a developing country. But as, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, but as as you said, uh, you know, technology potentially is a, is a, is a way around that, I guess, as uh, particularly now that, you know, you can get, Good internet connections, uh, you know, not just in urban centers, but also in rural areas to a certain extent. That's right. If you've got the money. <laughs> if you have the money, but it's become so. I've been advising a couple of Bolivian universities, and this would not have been possible through okay. pandemic. You know. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you know, probably internet connections there are not better than the ones you're experiencing right now. <laughs> so, no, no, no. Exactly. And, and even in Mozambique, you can get um, you know a reasonable three G internet yep. yeah connection in many rural areas these days and that's so that's a change you know over the last five years so you can do stuff online that you could never do before if you have the the megabytes as it were huge i agree yeah great well i i think we better um unfortunately i i mean it's a sad to cut it off um but uh, let me just say thank you so much miguel for, for your time uh, and for your insights, uh, I think really stimulating. And I would uh, recommend uh, anyone to 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 take a look at his new book. It's it's actually very interesting. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. And I would encourage you now to move to the next session, uh, whichever that may be. Thanks a lot. Thanks to everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Sam. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.